everyone, welcome to topic 180 in our countdown of the 200 highest yield topics on USMLE Step 1. Okay, so firstly, I just wanted to apologize for the lighting situation, really big window back here behind me so I apologize for that overall I wanted to thank you guys and congratulate you guys for making it through 10% of this playlist it's kind of crazy to believe that we've already done 20 videos for USMLE step one all right let's jump into this so basal cell carcinoma this is the most common skin malignancy okay that's particularly high yield to talk about so when we're talking about basal cell carcinoma we're going to be comparing a lot of the facts regarding it with squamous cell carcinoma and melanoma but again it's important to remember it's the most common skin malignancy it very rarely metastasizes this is something that it has in common with squamous cell carcinoma but even more so for basal cell carcinoma it's extremely rare that it would end up metastasizing so risk factors include sun exposure uv uh, radiation ionizing radiation and the classic disease process that we'll talk about that they like to ask about on step one is the zero derma pigmentosum and i'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about squamous cell carcinoma because these risk factors that you see here the sun exposure the radiation the zero derma pigmentosum these are all also risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma and one thing that i added added in here as well is fair-skinned individuals so if you have less melanocytes in general you're going to have an increased risk of having some form of primary carcinoma or even melanoma now, in reality, if you see a skin lesion, it's very difficult to distinguish between a squamous cell carcinoma or basal cell carcinoma. But on exam questions, classically, there are certain words they use to describe things that give away the answer. So for basal cell carcinoma, pearly is one of those keywords. So pink, pearly white type of lesion is something that they use frequently to describe a basal cell carcinoma. Sometimes they'll almost say it's almost translucent appearing. It could be dome shaped, it could be nodular, it could be raised, it could have a rolled border, it could be ulcerating, bleeding, and crusting. So these things really don't completely give it away, but the big thing is the term pearly, and also sometimes if you see that there's microscopic telangiectasias or blood vessels on the lesion itself, this is also classic for the basal cell carcinoma. Now the last thing I want to say is in terms of location of the lesions. In general, anywhere where there's sun exposure on the, you know, on the arms, on the legs, on the face, these are all classic places that you would have an increased risk of some form of primary skin carcinoma, like basal cell carcinoma. But you also have those same risk factors for squamous cell carcinoma. So to distinguish between these two, a lot of times in questions, they'll talk about a lesion on the lip. If the lesion is on the upper lip, it's classically going to be basal cell carcinoma. Lesion on the upper lip, basal cell carcinoma. So basal cell carcinoma, the actual carcinoma originated from cells in the basal layer of the epidermis. So in squamous cell carcinoma, the carcinoma originates from keratinocytes of the skin or mucosa. And this is the second most common form of skin cancer behind basal cell carcinoma. And as you can see from this image here, there really isn't anything that completely jumps out at me for this one that says, hey, you know what, this is squamous cell carcinoma. Now I'm not a dermatologist, so I, I'm not an expert either at telling different basal cell squamous cell grossly on gross appearance but it's very difficult to do that usually you have to get some form of biopsy whether it's a shave biopsy excisional or punch biopsy to really know what you're dealing with so in a board question it's a not it's not fair for them just to show you this and say what is it now we'll talk about some specific lesions that you can do this with on gross appearance but this isn't one of them now we already talked about risk factors and you can see that like we said squamous cell carcinoma is going to share a lot of the same risk factors sun exposure uv or ionizing radiation fair skin the other big things that that stand out a little bit more so with squamous cell carcinoma is going to be heavy alcohol intake or tobacco abuse, old scars or burns. So this could be like a painless or non-healing ulcer that's just kind of been sticking around. Maybe it's growing a little bit, it's bleeding, and you have this chronic scar that, like we said, is just not going away. That can suggest squamous cell carcinoma. Or if someone has had a burn that just has not healed at all, and it's like we said, it's painless, that also suggests squamous cell carcinoma. And we'll talk about why pain less. That has to do with infiltration of some of the neural tissue around the carcinoma. Now, the other thing that classically stands out with squamous cell carcinoma is immunosuppression. So patients that are immunosuppressed are at increased risk for squamous cell carcinoma. And this is classically going to be an abort question from someone that had a recent like organ transplant, right? Maybe they just had a kidney transplant and they're on immunosuppressants and now they have this new skin lesion that's growing, for example. That would suggest squamous squamous cell carcinoma. In the immunosuppressed population, if they have squamous cell carcinoma, they have an increased risk of local recurrence and regional metastasis as well 
in those patients. So the other thing that we kind of talked about briefly before was xerodermapigmentosum. And this is kind of the classic lesion that you see in xerodermapigmentosum. You can also see some conjunctival injection and potentially corneal ulcers. And corneal ulcers are very classic for xerodermapigmentosum as well. The big thing to remember about xerodermapigmentosum is not only the sunlight sensitivity, but also the reason why these patients have this condition. And that's because of a deficiency in the nucleotide excision repair, specifically the ability to remove thymidine dimers, whether that be in the skin, the corneal tissue. But in general, you want to be able to make those associations because a lot of times you'll see the question you know you'll be like yeah this person might have skin cancer because of xerodermapigmentosum but the question is going to ask you what is the pathogenic mechanism behind this disease process and so make sure you're familiar with that and again like we said earlier with basal cell carcinoma metastases are very rare with squamous cell carcinoma although they are a bit more common than they are in basal cell in general squamous cell carcinoma is the more aggressive variant between the basal cell and squamous cell carcinomas so just be familiar with that as well it's a little bit faster growing. Now, melanoma in general is going to have a much higher rate of metastases when compared to these two pathogenic processes. The other thing that's very classic, and I kind of touched on this earlier, is that there's early perineural invasion. In other words, you can have local neurologic numbness, paresthesias, painless lesions a lot of times. People may be asymptomatic because the carcinoma is invading the local neurologic structures. And so that's also a classic finding with squamous cell carcinoma. So that painless numbness tingling feeling over the lesion is something that you want to associate with this disease process as well. Now we said earlier that there are some classic keywords that come up when you talk about basal cell carcinoma. When you're talking about squamous cell carcinoma, some of those words overlap, but there's also some key things to look out for. Now you can get ulceration with basal cell carcinoma or squamous cell carcinoma, but in general, the plaques, the hyperkeratosis is a little bit more classic for squamous cell, but it's not pathognomonic. Ultimately, you have to biopsy the lesion to know what you're dealing with. Now in a board question, they know that, so sometimes they'll pick specific regions, like we talked about earlier with basal cell carcinoma, classically being on the upper lip and then squamous cell carcinoma on the lower lip. So make sure you're familiar with those two pathologies specifically because that's usually how they'll present it for you to grossly be able to figure out what's going on as opposed to giving you like a slide of, of the uh, lesion or something like that. And again, one key feature to call your attention to again is when you have carcinoma, we're saying the cancer cells have invaded the epidermal tissue and they're into the dermis. We have dermal invasion in basal cell carcinoma and squamous cell carcinoma. And again, like we said, typically for squamous cell carcinoma, it's gonna be an enlarging lesion that becomes keratinized. Like we said, hyperkeratosis, it can, it can be an ulcer. It might have a thick, rough surface. And a lot of times it might be non-healing, might be chronic, it might be painless because of the perineural invasion, and it could be bleeding or crusting as well. Classically, sun-exposed areas, lower lips for squamous cell carcinoma. So we said earlier, to diagnose this, you have to do a skin biopsy. You can do a punch biopsy, a shave biopsy, excisional biopsy, right? There's all different types that you can do, but the idea is ultimately the most important prognostic factor here is going to be the depth of invasion. You want to see, once you figure out what you're dealing with, you want to find out how deep did it invade the tissues, because this is going to be a very important marker for prognosis, right? How is this person going to get better? What do we have to do? And ultimately, what kind of treatment are we going to offer them? Whether that be chemotherapy in a metastatic lesion or just surgical excision. Now, if it's a high risk lesion, in other words, if it's fast growing or if it has a very big depth or very deep depth of invasion or it's in a cosmetically sensitive area. I want you to really remember that cosmetically sensitive area. If a person has a carcinoma on the face, we're going to go through Mohs micrographic surgery. So what exactly is Mohs micrographic surgery? So you can see that this physician here has a tool that allows them to see the tissues up close, right? So it's some type of tool that allows you to see the tissues on a more microscopic level. And so when you're doing a Mohs micrographic surgery, you're sequentially removing very thin layers of skin around the lesion and on the lesion to ultimately find out the margins of the lesion. So you're clearing out just enough tissue, but you're ensuring that you get all of it. So that's number one. You're ensuring that you get all of it because it's a micrographic surgery. Now, in reality, technically, cells can be infected with cancer that we can't see. You have a much better opportunity to get more of the lesion 
if you can see it microscopically. And so that's the idea here. The second part of that is you don't take too much tissue. So if you're on the face, instead of me just cutting a hole out right around the lesion, I can be very precise with Mohs micrographic surgery and just take out very thin layers of the skin to make sure I get the entire lesion, but also make sure that I don't disrupt surrounding structure and I can make it look better cosmetically as well. And because of that, the Mohs micrographic surgery has a much higher cure rate in general from primary carcinomas than just a standard surgical excision. Okay, so for basal cell carcinoma, on histology, because we know USMLE step one loves histology, what are some classic things you'll see? So this image in particular isn't the thing that I would say that you really want to hold your hat on, but let's just talk about it really quickly. So here you can see these nests of what are basaloid cells in the dermis, and they form these lobulated collections, these nests of basaloid cells. They have very hyperchromatic nuclei, very prominent nuclei. We normally expect basal cells to mature and lose their nuclei and not to be in the dermis with very hyperchromatic nuclei. But the thing that classically gives this disease process away in a board question is the way that they word the histopathologic findings. A lot of times they don't expect you to recognize palisading basophilic cells, but they do expect you to recognize the term palisading. So if they write out a question and they say that this patient has basophilic palisading cells on their you know, skin lesion, then it's basal cell carcinoma. Okay, so if you see palisading, you wanna think basal cell carcinoma. Now for squamous cell carcinoma, it's kind of the opposite. You actually should recognize this image. This is an extremely high yield image. Whenever you see a keratin pearl, you need to know right away that you're dealing with a squamous cell carcinoma and it doesn't have to be on the skin it could be a head and neck cancer it could be lung cancer with keratin pearls you have to know that squamous cell carcinoma so go on google look at like 10 pictures of keratin pearls classically you see this very eosinophilic or pink um, kind of circular uh, structure that's essentially representing these very invasive cords of squamous cells that are surrounded by these keratin pearls. And you can see it looks like lymphocytes out here and here we're in some cartilage. Maybe we're, we're in like the larynx in this case. But in general, keratin pearls on histology is classic for squamous cell carcinoma. And I would definitely know this image more than I would the palisading image, but both are important to know in general. This is the really important one though. Now remember I said earlier that if you just see a lesion on the skin, it's hard to know exactly what you're dealing with. Is it basal cell, is it squamous cell? The exception here is this keratoacanthoma. If you see this elevated, very nodular, they call it volcano-like, you can see it's very elevated off of the skin here, and, and it has a central keratotic plug. This is classic for a keratoacanthoma. So what is it exactly? It's a variant of squamous cell carcinoma. Very rapidly growing, but the interesting thing is it tends to regress spontaneously, and it's a very well-differentiated squamous cell carcinoma a lot of the time. They're, it's treated that way, at least. The big thing to know is on gross appearance, what it looks like, and know that it's a variant of squamous cell carcinoma. So again, go on Google, look at 10 images of this, just so you can get your your mind wrapped around what these keratoacanthomas look like, and they're all very similar in appearance. Now, actinic keratosis is going to be a pre-malignant lesion. In other words, we don't have squamous cell carcinoma at this point, but it can lead to squamous cell carcinoma. And so on biopsy, there's no invasion into the dermis yet. Once we invade the dermis, then we're dealing with in this case, squamous cell carcinoma potentially. But until we invade the dermis, it is not squamous cell carcinoma. We're dealing with a pre-malignant lesion. Classically, this is going to be in an older patient with a lot of sun exposure, and it's described as like an adherent scale. It has, it has some yellow crusting a lot of the times. It's very rough. They call it sandpaper texture as well. And it has a lot of the similar risk factors that we talked about for basal and squamous cell carcinoma, but it's particularly related to the squamous cell carcinoma class. Finally, we have Bowen's disease, which is again, a squamous cell carcinoma in situ. In other words, we have not yet invaded the dermis on biopsy. This is usually a very well demarcated lesion, as you can see here, and it's typically very erythematous. There's a whole variant of these that we'll, we might talk about when we talk about the uh, genital lesions that are related to this, but in general, when you're thinking about bone disease, remember it's an in situ squamous cell carcinoma, so it has not yet invaded the dermis, so it's very in the very early stages, so to speak. Okay, so the big three things, upper lip, basal cell carcinoma, lower lip is squamous cell carcinoma. That is particularly high yield to remember. On histopathology, if you see palisading cells, it's basal cell carcinoma. Keratin pearls, it's squamous, and make sure that you can recognize keratin pearls. The risk factors for basal and squamous cell carcinoma are very similar. Squamous cell carcinoma in particular, though, has some additional risk factors, that being heavy alcohol intake, tobacco use, again, these chronic burns or scars that are painless or bleeding that just haven't seemed to go, on, go away and they're, and they're enlarging. Think squamous cell carcinoma, particularly in the setting of immunosuppression. And here are your pictures to remember. The big ones that I really want you to remember, though, are going to be these keratin pearls, and then know what xeroderma pigmentosa looks like 
like if it comes up in a question and just remember nucleotide excision repair and thymidine dimers. Okay, so here's the question. I'll give you five seconds and we'll go through the answer. Okay, so in this case, we have an older gentleman who has a lot of sun exposure. It looks like he uh, works on a farm. So with all that sun exposure, he certainly has risk factors for pretty much everything on just for all five options. However, the pathology report reveals atypical keratinocytes, okay, hyperpigmented and occasional pleomorphic nuclei. But the key, key point is that it's extending into the basal layer of the epidermis with no evidence of dermal invasion. That's very, very important. There's no evidence of dermal invasion. That's going to help guide us to the answer here. So squamous cell carcinoma, we would expect dermal invasion. Maybe we would see some keratin pearls perhaps on imaging as well. The keratoacanthoma classically is described as the volcano-like nodule with a central keratotic plug. And we can see this is, you know, maybe mildly elevated, but we don't have that classic nodular uh, gross appearance of the keratoacanthoma here. So it's probably not that. Basal cell carcinoma, we would also expect dermal invasion, right? We don't have dermal invasion here, where there's no mention of palisading cells or anything like that. Melanoma will classically have atypical melanocytes and cytologic atypia. A lot of the times we'll see metastases with melanoma. The dermal epidermal junction will be obscured. And we'll talk a little bit more about that when we go through melanoma. But the fact that there's no dermal invasion, again, argues against melanoma. And finally, we have actinic keratosis, which is a precursor to squamous cell carcinoma. And again, this is the classic patient you'll see this with, right? An older patient who has a, a lot of sun exposure, biopsy showing no dermal invasion is going to point you down the direction of actinic keratosis. It's very unlikely it will be any of the other ones on this list for reasons mentioned above, including the dermal invasion. And then for keratoacanthoma, this looks nothing like what we would expect to see in gross appearance of a keratoacanthoma.